Christ we come. Lord, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. God, we praise you tonight for you are good and you are God. God, we honor you tonight, Father God, for who you are, for what you've done, and what you're doing right now. You are holy. You are Lord. We thank you, Father God, for trusting us again and trusting us with your word. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for messing up. Forgive us for falling short. Forgive us for not doing the things that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we acknowledge that we are sinners. Lord, we acknowledge that without Jesus Christ, we are nothing. But Lord, you've given us another chance. You've given us another opportunity. And tonight, Father God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us again. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we attend Bible study. We ask that the Holy Spirit teach us, that the Holy Spirit enforce us learning. Bless us, Father God, that the Holy Spirit, Father God, will speak to our heart in such a way that lives will be changed. Hope will be renewed. Relationships will be restored. And that you will get the glory all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. He is Lord. He is. He is Lord. He has risen. He has risen from the dead. 
And right now he is Lord. And because he's Lord, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus, that Jesus, Jesus Christ, he is Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We've come tonight to honor he who is, he who is Lord. Jesus Christ, he is, he is Lord. Hallelujah. And every now and then, we need to be reminded that every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. If you don't do it now, you will do it soon. That Jesus Christ, he is he is Lord. He is Lord. He Amen. is Lord. We're in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Tonight we will begin at verse number 5 and end at verse number 10, if God says the same. 1 John, in the New Testament, in the back of your Bible, right before you hit Revelation, you will find 1 John. We're in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10 is where we are tonight. We serve the risen Savior, and he is, he is Lord. Hallelujah. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Let us review what we talked about in the first four verses on last week. We realized that John, John is writing, the apostle John is writing, and he addressed Jesus Christ as the word. John also parallels 1 John with St. John. St. John is found in the beginning of the New Testament, whereas 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John is at the end of the New Testament, right before Revelation. Amen? Right before Revelation. So we established also last week that John is writing to a particular audience. He's writing to a particular audience audience. What audience is he writing to? He is writing to a particular audience. What audience is he writing? What audience? We talked about last week that he's not writing to the unsaved people, but he's writing to the saved people. Right, already saved. He's writing to those who are already saved. So, Sir David, if you would lay that on the seat, it wouldn't pick you up so well. First John, first John, first John, 1 John chapter 1, he's writing to a particular audience. This audience is the born again. This audience is the same. This audience is the group of people who love Jesus Christ, who say they do anyway. This is a group who believe in the gospel story. The fact that Jesus died and he was buried and he rose from the dead. So he's writing to the saved, the born again. So he's writing to the saved, therefore he's going to talk to saved people about their spiritual growth. And as he talk about his, our spiritual growth, he's going to talk about our fellowship one to the other, right? And he's going to talk about our fellowship with God. He ends in verse number four by saying, in the first pericope, he ends verse number four by saying that I'm telling you these things about Jesus Christ about him being the word and the word was God and the word was with God and the word became flesh according to John chapter one, St. John chapter one, verse number 14. And he closes out that particular pericope by saying, these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Now what he's doing here, he's, had, he's talking about a parallel joy. He's talking to the apostles and he's also talking to us. He's talking to the people who are saved. He's saying, as our joy is full, your joy will be full. So we have a parallel joy. Those who have come before us have full joy in the fact that Jesus has died, rose again. He has come on the scene. Now we have fellowship with the Father. Now we have fellowship with the Son. Therefore, our joy is full. Not only is their joy full, our joy, even in the 21st century, is full. And the only way I can, I can receive full joy, the only way you can receive full joy, 
is that Jesus Christ is realized and he is the one who has saved us. And we realize that through him alone do we receive our salvation. He says to us in the first pericope that, that life was manifested and we have seen and we have bared witness. We have bore witness and we have declared him. In other words, we have proclaimed Jesus Christ. He is the eternal one who gives us eternal life. In other words, we do not have life without Christ. We exist without him. We breathe without him. We walk around on earth without him. But John says that he has come that we might have life and have that life more abundantly. Life on earth and life after death more abundantly. In other words, we cannot have abundant life. We, had, we can't have life overflowing in full without receiving Jesus Christ as our Savior. So now we have joy. In the midst of trouble, we still have joy. In the midst of hopeless situations, we still have joy. In the midst of trials and tribulations, we still have joy because happiness is determined by what goes on on the outside of us. We are sad when things don't go our way. But when we have joy, it can be turmoil on the outside. It could be storming in our lives. And we still have the joy of the Lord. And it only comes through Jesus Christ himself. So let's look at verse number five. He picks up in verse number five, the second pericope in this chapter. These are very short chapters. So he, he will end in, in this pericope in, in verse number 10 tonight. So he looks at, let's look at verse number five. This is the message which we have heard. This is the message which we have heard from him. What message? This message of joy, this message that Jesus Christ has come and died. We have heard this message from him. This same Christ that was seen. Coming down through 42 generations, this same Jesus Christ that was on the scene in the flesh, he was God in the flesh. He is the word and the word became flesh. He's God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. He is God. Hyperstatic union. What is that? Hyperstatic union. What is that? 100% man, 100%. 100% man and 100% God. Jesus Christ brings us what is known as the hyperstatic union. H-Y-P-E-R-S-T-A-T-I-C. Hyperstatic union. H-Y-P-E-R-S-T-A-T-I-C. The hyperstatic union. It is only in Jesus Christ, meaning that Jesus is just as much God as God, and Jesus is just as much man as man. He is the hypostatic union. He is the one who brings man and God together. Not only is he the man of God, he is the God-man. He is the God-man. He is God in the flesh. And there we have what is known as the hypostatic union. So John says in verse number five, this is the message which we have heard from him. Then he says, and declared to you. In other words, this message that we heard, we have heard from Jesus Christ, this message that Jesus has manifested himself before us, we got to tell other folk about it. We ought to declare this same message. You may change the method, but don't change the message. In other words, how you deliver the word, how you transmit the word may change. But don't change the message. Youth and young people are rapping for Christ. It's okay 
if it's not traditionally done. It's all right if it's not done in the old traditional way we know it. You can wrap it. I just wish more youth would wrap the word of God, not just hype. We need to make sure if we change the method, don't change the, me the message. The message must be the same, that Jesus has bought us. We've been bought with a price, and he did it on Calvary. So we declare this unto you, that God is light. We declare unto you that God is light. Now, when he says the word light, he's referring to the moral character of God. Wouldn't it be good if we had people, even in church, that had just a tad bit of more of moral character? I mean, just, just a little bit character, just a little bit of morality, just a little bit of, of things that is right and wrong. So God has a moral character about himself. He is the light. When we walked in the room, we turned on the light. Darkness had to flee. God being light cannot be in the midst of darkness. And we will find out in, in the next few verses that because he's light, he doesn't want us to walk in darkness. He want us to walk in the light. This word light refers to his moral character. We must have to admit. We must admit that God is holy. We must admit that God does not touch, doesn't even look like sin. God is light. Everything about God is holy. Everything we see in God is holy. God is light. And when we walk in the light, we walk in holiness. John continues to say, he says, and in him is no darkness at all. In the country, they would say he's no dark. There is no darkness at all. So in other words, there is no darkness in God at all. God is light. God is holy. He can't touch sin. Sin can't touch him. He, he can't co-mingle with sin. He, sin cannot stand, God, stand in God's presence. And God will not be in the presence of sin. God is light. He is holy. There's no darkness in him at all. Verse number six. If we say that we have fellowship with him. With who? With God. If we say we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we have fellowship with darkness and we walking in the light, we have fellowship with, with when we say that we have fellowship with God and we do not walk in the light, then we're walking in the darkness. We really don't have fellowship with God. Sin is equal to darkness. Light is equal to purity. God is holy. Therefore, God is asking us to be pure. We must walk in the light. If you're going to walk with God, you got to walk in the light. Look at verse number six. It says, if we say that we have fellowship with God, if we have fellowship with God, if we are walking with God, if we are standing with God, if we have fellowship with God, then we're walking in the light. If we are living in the midst of a holy God, the holy God. Then we're walking in the light. We are not walking in darkness. We are not walking in sin. We need to understand that God is light. And if we say, if we just speak it, doesn't make it right. If we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say that we have fellowship with God, and still we are walking in darkness, the Bible says we lie. Because God cannot 
exist in darkness. God cannot exist in sin. Therefore, the author John says, if we say we have fellowship with God and we're in the midst of sin, we just lost fellowship with God. And if we say we're in the midst of, 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 of the light and we're walking in fellowship with God and we're, in, we're actually in darkness, then the author says we just told a lie. A false truth which is not truth at all. Prevarication. He says, says to us tonight that in order to walk in fellowship with God, you got to walk in the light. In order to walk in fellowship with God, you got to have a more character that God looks forward to seeing. God wants you to have a moral character a character of holiness, a character of purity, just like him. I hear somebody saying now, but none of us are perfect. You're right. It takes Jesus to even make us think about doing right. Verse number six, if you say that you have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, he lie, you lie, and do not practice the truth. We, we, don't, we don't admit to what's truth. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people say they are with God. A lot of people will tell you they're with God. A lot of people will, will even announce that they're with God. But when you see their fruit, you don't even have to judge them. When you see their fruit, you will find out if they're with God or not. They can say they with God. When you see how they treat other people, you, that determines if they're walking with God. So the question becomes, well, if I'm saved, am I not walking with God? Yeah, you are saved. Yes, you are walking with God. But the moment sin is entertained by you, the moment sin takes place in you, the moment you yield to temptation, you are no longer walking in fellowship with God. We have to walk in fellowship with him. In our strut, we got to strut with God. In our living, we got to live with God. In our behavior, we got to live and behave with God. If we don't have the behavior of God, we're walking in darkness. And I told you, God has no place for darkness. And God does not spend his time in darkness. So why are we spending our time in darkness? If you're going to walk with God, you can't spend your time in darkness. You got to walk with him. And this word walk is not putting one step in front of the other. This word walk means your lifestyle. It's the same word we get the biblical term uh, uh, conversation. Meaning that our conversation, our lives, our lifestyle is one that reflects holiness. He says, if you, if you say you, you're walking with God, if you say you have fellowship with God and you walk in darkness, you lie and you do not practice the truth. Isn't that something? Are there any liars in the house? Now, that's a good subject. Isn't it? Are there any liars? All liars, raise your hand. I mean, that's a good subject. That's a good Sunday morning service. Sunday service on Sunday morning. The question is, are there any liars in the house? Raise your hand. At one given time or the other, everybody in the room ought to raise their hand. Because at some given time, you have not walked according to godliness. Verse number seven, first John chapter one, verse number seven but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
Check out what he says. If our lives and our lifestyle line up with God, then we declare we walk in the light. And he says, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God. He said that in verse number six, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship in God with God. Then he says in verse number seven, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship one to the other. In other words, we cannot walk in the light and be unequally yoked with God. My, my, my. Paul says to the Corinthian church, be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now John says, we can be unequally yoked among each other. We can be believers. The one who walks in the light is walking with God. The one who's not walking in the light is, is not equally yoked with us. And therefore, the one who is not walking in the light cannot walk with God. Now he says, we cannot walk with each other in agreement. Because when we're in fellowship, we don't want to call it. He says, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And he goes further to say, verse number seven, in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. It takes Jesus' blood. Your children have your blood, but it's just here for physical reasons. If they're going to be cleaned up, it's going to take the blood of Jesus. And he shedded his blood on Calvary for you and for me, that we can be cleansed, that we can be made clean, that sin can be blotted out. It's only the blood of Jesus that can cleanse us. It's only his blood. A man was going to court one day, and there was a witness put on the witness stand. And he knew the witness knew the truth. And he thought the witness was going to testify against him. He leaned down behind one of the pews in the courtroom and just said, Lord, blot it out. Lord, blot it out. Lord, blot it out. Don't hold it to my charge, Lord. Blot it out. And when the witness began to speak, he never even mentioned the bad things he did. He only mentioned the good. Let me tell you, there are witnesses that have seen us, witnesses that have heard about us. But when they got on the witness stand, the Holy Spirit blotted out, gave us another chance. And it only happened through the blood of Jesus. Jesus knew we were wrong. He knew we were sentenced to death. He knew we deserved to be sentenced to death. But he took our sins on Calvary and blotted them out. And check this out. He cleansed us where we wouldn't have to do it anymore. Now, you may do some sins, and you will. We're going to find out in verse 8, 9, and 10. You're going to do some sins. But Jesus' blood is the only way you can be purified. Jesus' blood blots it out. Isn't that something? He cleanses us. The blood of Jesus. Who is Jesus? The author says it is his son. Who is his? God's only begotten son. God's only unique son. No one can take the place of you. And no one will take the place of you. But Jesus, he blotted it out. Hallelujah. And check this out. When he blotted it out, he didn't expose our stuff. What if Jesus would have exposed your stuff? Because let me tell you, church folk and Christians and Christians talk about how they can forgive you, but they just keep bringing it up. They're going to remind you of when you were. Hey, you, you, were, you were just like that. And I remember when you were. I remember what you did. I remember how you said it. I remember what you said. People will always 
bring up your past. You need to remind them of your future. The fact of the matter is Jesus has cleansed us. He has blinded out. It is the symbol of the Old Testament priest where the priest would take his hands and lay his hand on the, the head of a goat. The people of Israel would be standing there. The whole nation would be standing there and this priest would lay his hand on the goat. And it was a transferring of their sins to the goat. So he would lay his hands on the goat and when he removed his hand from the goat, the goat would take off and run through the wilderness. It is a symbol that Jesus has become our scapegoat. And the sins of men have been transferred from us to Jesus, and Jesus has taken our sins far away. That's where we get the word scapegoat. The last time your boss lied on you, they use you as a scapegoat. The scapegoat is somebody who is innocent, but he takes on the punishment of the guilty. Have you ever been a scapegoat? Have they ever used you? Have you ever been a scapegoat to let somebody else go free? But they used you and condemned you? Have you ever been a scapegoat for your department? When, when they said somebody going to have to take the rap. There are children all over this world going to prison for something they didn't do. They have become the scapegoat for somebody, and they voluntarily become the scapegoat. I told my wife and my children, I take a bullet for you, but I ain't going to jail for you. So I won't be your scapegoat. I'm not, I'm not going to, I, I can't do it. Jesus has become our scapegoat. He has taken our sins and, run, and, and moved them far away from us. He has cleansed us. He has washed us. He has blotted out. Now, if Jesus has cleansed you, he has washed you, why do you keep going back picking it up? He has taken our sins. The text declares, verse number six. Verse number seven, the text declares that in, in, in the blood of Jesus, his son, the son of God, cleanses us from all sin. He leaves no sin out. If we, if, if we are humble enough, look at verse number eight. To give it to him, he, he is faithful to take it. Verse number eight says, for if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. A lie will run a mile before the truth put his shoes on. You don't believe me? Let somebody lie on you right now before church is over. It, it, and we got Twitter now, too. We got text messages now also. A lie will run a mile before the truth put his or her shoes on. If you say that you have no sin, you deceive no one but yourself. Because guess what? Everybody else knows you got sin. And you trying to convince yourself. I asked a person the other day, are you trying to convince me or you? Are you trying to convince you? that you have no sin, or are you trying to convince me that you have no sin? And you can tell when a person is trying to convince someone that they have no sin, they say the same thing over and over again, and it was a lie when you said it the first time, it's a lie when you said it the 10th time. But some people are so skilled until they can tell the same lie over and over again, the same way, until they begin to believe their own lie. John says that there are people who say they have no sin, and they said over and over again, and guess who they deceived? No one but themselves. It says, says to us, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. You know why the truth is not in us? 
Because if we tell one lie and that lie says that we have no sin, we got to tell another lie. And then it becomes, it goes from a little, I don't know why everything that's black is, is bad, but, but when you tell a little white lie, then you got to hit it with a big black lie. It is the symbol of men sitting under the oak tree. This time of year with a barrel, an open barrel with wood in it. And they're exchanging stories. Got fire coming out of it. They're exchanging stories. And you can tell, one, you can tell, and they'll, they'll even tell you, I told a big one today. <laughs> they are sitting there exchanging stories, exchanging lies to see who can tell the biggest lie. And guess what? Everybody that's around the fireplace know they lie. But they're trying to convince you and trying to convince themselves that it is the truth. The Bible says, if you say you have no sin, you are telling a lie. And he goes on to say, and the truth ain't in you. I notice, I, I notice some children, I, I mean, they just fabricate stuff. I mean, and I ask them sometimes, what was the purpose of that lie? I mean, you didn't even have to tell that one. I mean, you could have saved that one to tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, they, they just come up with stuff, and you can't even make it up. And you're trying to figure out what was the purpose of that one. Now, I understood why you said you didn't break the window. I understood that one. But now this one, I don't even understand it. There was no sinners. There was no judgment. There was no indictment. And you still, just, I mean, you're just a liar. And the old folks say, if you lie, you will. you steal. If you lie, you steal. And people are lying and stealing for no apparent reason. So he says that if you say you have no sin, you lie and the truth ain't in you. Verse number nine says, this is somebody's favorite scripture. It ought to be all our favorite. It says, if we sin, this word if in the original context means when. It says, if we confess our sin, when we confess our sins. When we confess our sins, God, he is faithful. God is faithful. And God is just. God is faithful and God is just. God is faithful. That meaning God is trustworthy. If we confess our sins, we've already established that we all sin, right? And we already established that if a person say they don't sin, then they tell them a lie. So then verse number, number nine says, if we sin or when we sin, it says, if we confess this sin that we know we have sinned, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God always taking us a step further than what we ask. Up there, up there in the previous verse, he says that he's willing to forgive us. Then he says, if you're willing to confess, this word confess, confess means to acknowledge. All God wants you to do is acknowledge your sin. Admit to it. All God wants you to do is say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. Repentance is in, in, in play. And when you repent, the word repent means to change one's mind. So he says, if we confess our sin, if we acknowledge our sin, God is faithful. God is trustworthy. You don't have to go get references when it comes to God. You don't have to worry about if he's a part of the Better Business Bureau. You don't have to go and get pictures in a portfolio on God. John says God is trustworthy. He is faithful. And then not only is he faithful, 
He is just, meaning that he's right. So when God judges us, he judges us faithfully. He judges us in a trustworthy manner. That he's not impartial. He is right. He's going to judge us right. When God judges you rightly, are you going to be happy about it? <laughs> he's going to judge you rightly. He, he's a righteous judge. The question is, will you be happy when God judges you? Every time the teacher passed the test back, once he, he's graded the test or she's graded the test, every time the grades are put on the test, there are some glad and there are some sad. A pastor friend of mine said, if a ship came in, it was a big ship. Y'all know what it means when, when they say my ship comes in, when my ship comes in. What are y'all talking about when y'all say my ship, when my ship comes in? Money. 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 Is that, it, it comes in on a ship, so it's going to come in on a big old ship, right? One of my, one of my pastor friends said when, he, when his ship comes in, he's going to call every member to the church in one by one. And what he's going to say at the end of the year, everything you have given the Lord, this year, I'm going to give you that back. <laughs> he, says, he says, when my ship comes in, when my ship is right, I'm going to give the Lord 10%. And then I'm going to call every member of the church in. And I'm going to have the tally sheet right there before me. And I'm going to turn around and say, Joe Blow. You gave $50 this year from January to December 31st. From January to 1 to December 31st. You gave $50. Here you go. I'm going to give you $50. God bless you. Then you're going to look at Jane Doe and say, Jane Doe, you gave $4,500 this year. Jane Doe, I'm going to give you $4,500. Then they're going to call in Bob Joe Blow. Bob Joe Blow. You gave $20,000 this year. From January 1 to December 31st, I'm going to give you $25,000 or $20,000, whatever you've given. I'm going to give it back to you. Let me tell you something. There are going to be those who leave that office who are going to be glad, but unfortunately, there are going to be some people that's going to be sad. Now, who should they be glad about? And who should they be sad about? What should they be sad about? Why, why would they be upset? Deacon Alfred, you gave $28,000 this year. My ship came in. I'm going to give you $28,000. Boy, Deacon Alfred's going to be skipping out. I mean, he's just going to be skipping out the door. <laughs> But what I call in Melissa Blojo. Say, yeah, girl, you you really did you did increase this year. You went from ten dollars a year to forty two dollars a year. I tell you what, I'm gonna be kind to you. I gave everybody else what they gave. I'm gonna be kind to you. I'm gonna give you what you gave last year and I'll give you what you gave this year. And here is your forty, fifty five dollars or whatever it is. God is a just God. God deals with us righteously. And if you're stingy, God can only repay what you've given. That's why we don't give tithes or, or we don't pay tithes. We return tithes. Because all of it belongs to God. God gave it to us. Now we're returning it back to him. Questions or comments? He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, meaning that he's trustworthy. He's just, meaning that he's righteous, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me tell you something. The analogy that I just gave, now God can do whatever God wants to do. Somebody's still going to be mad. 
But God is so faithful. I mean, God is so trustworthy. God is so just. God is so righteous. Until you can't find a problem with God. But guess what? Somebody will be mad with God. They're going to be mad regardless. Somebody's going to be mad with God. They're going to be upset with God. But God is faithful. And God is just. And he forgives us our sins. And all he asks us to do is confess it, acknowledge it. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God takes it a step further. Not only does he clean you up from this particular sin, he cleans you up from all unrighteousness. Look at God. He cleans us up. He, he washes us off. Verse number 10, 1 John chapter 1, verse 10. If we, have, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, make God a liar. And his word is not in us. Remember now, he's talking to, to born again people. Because God can never be a liar. Because God can never change from being a righteous God, a just God, to a unjust God, then you're living in denial. He said, he said look at verse number 10, I don't leave you long. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a lie. Now this blows a hole into the theory of naming and claiming your righteousness. If you think you are so saved until you don't sin, the Bible says you are a liar and you're calling God a liar. It says in verse 9, you're a liar. Then he says in verse 10, you're calling God a liar. So you're going you're gonna to sail this ship on down the road. It, it says, it says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. How many times you heard God lie? Let me tell you something. There are a lot of people that said God said it and it didn't happen. So who lied? Was it God? So many people every single day miss what God has to say. And they falsely accuse God. And they hear something, but it's not God. They hear somebody, but it's not God. Because God can't lie. There's no way for God to lie. God, God is not his character. God cannot lie. It's not God's nature to sin. It is not God's nature to lie. God cannot sin. God cannot lie. And when you think that you say that God, God is lying, that's what, what it means is you're in denial. <laughs> you just out there on your own. That's when you cut and, and sell them away. God doesn't have a sin nature like we have. The author deals with both our works and our words. And when he deals with our works and our words, God will always be God, so we have to always be godly. I want to be on God's side. When the smoke clears, I want to be walking with God. When the trouble hits, I want to be walking with God. When the sun is shining, I want to be walking with God. The author says, if we say that we have not sinned. So he deals with a particular sin, and then he deals with a multitude of sin. God misses nothing. All he wants us to do is confess it. God, here I come again. Lord, I messed up again. 
That's why Jesus talks about when you pray, you ought to glorify God. You ought to magnify him. You ought to ask God's will to be done as, as it is. Bring God's kingdom as it is in heaven. Lord, forgive us. Jesus said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, God, we have sinned against you as we forgive sinners who've sinned against us. We want you to forgive us. The reverse is as true. If we don't forgive, we don't deserve forgiveness. So repentance is in order. In order for forgiveness to be in order. We make God a lie, totally impossible. And then he finally says, his word is not in us. When you walk in God's word, when you live by God's principles, then you understand God. When we, when we read one of the Psalms, I think it's Psalms 139, the Bible says that God showed his ways to Moses and showed his mighty, mighty acts to the children of Israel. It's important for every leader to know God's ways because the people just looking for his acts. So if you're leading anybody, you need to know God's ways. If you are a Christian, you need to know God's ways. You need to know God's character. Because when somebody comes to you and say God said it, you can say that's not God's character. When they say that, that the Holy Spirit told them, you can tell them that's not God's character. Woman puts her baby in the microwave, microwave her baby, talking about she saw a demon. You know that's not God's character. You know something else going on, something else going wrong. God's character does not change. God is immutable, meaning that God does not change. God does not change. God is God. He's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. So tell me, any questions or comments? Come on, give me a quick review of what we covered tonight. God is light. He doesn't exist in darkness. And if we walk in the light, we walk with God. There's no sin in God. And if a man says that he or she does, if they say that we do not sin, they, you know you're lying. You know they're lying. And if they, they say that they haven't sinned, then they're calling God a light. And the Bible says the truth is not in them. And when they realize that they've, they've sinned, you got to make sure you confess it. As you walk in sin, as you get, you get caught in sin. People say they get caught in sin, but they intended to do it. When sin is revealed in your life, what you need to make sure of, you confess it. Because we have a trustworthy God. We have a righteous God. The text declares he's trustworthy in the fact that he is faithful. He is righteous in the fact that he's just. He is God. No man is like him. The same God made it possible. Look at the verse. The verse says that Jesus Christ in his blood that was shed it on Calvary, verse number seven, we need to make sure we understand that Jesus Christ's blood is the only thing that can save us and cleanse us. That's why the hymnologist says it like this. He says, what can watch away our sin? And, 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 and I, say, I say he said it because what he does, he asks the question and then he gives an answer. So he asked the question, what can wash away my sin? And he answers the question, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Therefore, we must believe that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. After they killed him, they pierced him in his side. I know you've heard it preached that, that, that Jesus Christ was pierced and then he died. The fact of the matter is the Bible says that he died and then they pierced him in his side. 
Out came blood and water. His blood cleanses us. They took the same Jesus down from the cross, laid the same Jesus in a barber tomb. Joseph of Arimathea's barber tomb, they laid him in a brand new tomb, Joseph's brand new tomb. They, they laid Jesus in a tomb that had never been, been slept in, never been, a dead man had never been in. And the Bible says early that third day morning, he rose from the dead with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. If you can believe this story, you can be saved tonight. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You need to come to Jesus Christ just as you are. If you can just believe that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, and he rose from the dead, you can be saved right here, right now, tonight. If you never received Jesus as your personal Savior, join me in this prayer, and you can do this tonight. Very simple prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and thank God. We believe that if you pray this prayer honestly, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he died and rose from the dead, we believe that you're born again. When you die, you're going to heaven. The text declares that we ought to repent, we ought to confess our sins. I want to pray with all of us tonight and ask God to forgive us for our sins. For he's the only one who can forgive us. Father God, we ask you tonight, Father, to forgive us for our sins. We come now to acknowledge them, to admit, to confess them, Father God, that we've fallen short. We've not done the things that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask you to forgive us. Renew us. We come to repent. We come to rededicate. We come to say you are right and we're wrong. Lord, we thank you for forgiving us. We ask you to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. If you're without a church home, you're in between church homes, I recommend the New Beginning Church. Inbox us and let, let us know that you want to be a member, you want to join, and we will welcome you to this great family of faith in Southeast Houston. You can be locally located or you can be globally located. We we welcome you to the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship. Thank you again to our visitors. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of our service. Thank you for Bible study. Please feel free to tune in on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school class. Tune in at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday morning for our worship service. And again, follow us every Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. for our Bible study. Next week, we'll be going to 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, where John continues to tell Christians how to live their life and how to trust in Jesus, how to know God. We want to lift those in prayer who has, who has been sick, those who have been burdened, those who are bereaved. We want to pray for, for Sister Hughes. We want to pray for Brother Ewan Miles. We want to pray for Sister Darrington. 
We want to pray for Gladys Flores. Is there, are there any other prayer requests that we have? And all those that's been listed on our, our prayer list, we want to lift them and pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for who you are, for what you do. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us, Father God, to be able to call on you and trust you. We know you as trustworthy. We know you as righteousness. We know you as faithful. We know you, Father God, as just. Now, Lord, we ask you to heal, touch, and deliver. We pray that you lift up every bowed down head, lift every fever, lift every ailment. We pray, Father God, for the Funberger family. We pray for those who we've called out. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us and keeping us. Lord, we thank you for this Bible study. We thank you, Father, that you have revealed yourself and unveiled yourself unto us. Bless us tonight as we come to sing unto you through choir rehearsal, that we will sing unto you, Father God, and give you all the glory. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join by saying, Amen, Amen. For those of you who are giving to our ministry by way of P.O. Box or mail, you can do so by mailing your offering in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. And if you want to give by way of Zelle, you can do so by giving by way of lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Again, thank you so much. Those of you who are in, in the room, you can come now and give your offering. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.